Father, this morning we echo the words of this song. Take our heart, conform it. Take our mind, transform it. Father, we pray that you'll do that right now. Lord, you desire righteousness. You desire holiness. You desire faithfulness, O oh God. Father, help us to be the person that you desire us to be. My brother, my sister, in an attitude of prayer, come let's sing those words again. Take my heart, take my mind, take my will. Take my heart Won't you open your Bibles to the book of Habakkuk, chapter 2, from verse 2. Habakkuk, chapter 2, from verse 2. In the church Bible, it's page 1049. Page 1049 in a church Bible. Habakkuk. Chapter 2. Well, let's read from verse 1. I will stand at my watch and station myself on the ramparts. I will look to see what he will say to me and what answer I am to give to this complaint. Then the Lord replied, Write down the revelation and make it plain on tablets so that a herald may run with it for the revelation awaits an appointed time it speaks of the end and will not prove false though it linger wait for it it will certainly come and will not delay see he is puffed up he desires are not upright, but the righteous will live by his faith. Indeed, wine betrays him. He is arrogant and never at rest, because he is as greedy as the grave, and like death is never satisfied. He gathers to himself all the nations and takes captive all the peoples. Will not all of them taunt him with ridicule and scorn, saying, Woe to him who piles up stolen goods and makes himself wealthy by extortion. How long must this go on? Will not your debtors suddenly arise? Will they not wake up and make you tremble? Then you will become their victim. Because you have plundered many nations, the people who are left will plunder you. For you have shed man's blood, you have destroyed lands and cities and everyone in them. Woe to him who builds his realm by unjust gain, to set his nest on high, to escape the clutches of ruin. 
You have plotted the ruin of many people, shaming your own house and forfeiting your life. The stones of the wall will cry out and the beams of the woodwork will echo it. Woe to him who builds a city with bloodshed and establishes a town by crime. Has not the Lord Almighty determined that the people's labor is only fuel for the fire, that the nations exhaust themselves for nothing? For the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters covers the sea. Woe to him who gives drink to his neighbor, pouring it from the wineskin till they are drunk so that they can gaze on their naked bodies. You will be filled with shame instead of glory. Now it is your turn. Drink and be exposed. The cup from the Lord's right hand is coming around to you and disgrace will cover you. Disgrace will cover your glory. The violence you have done to Lebanon will overwhelm you and your, and your destruction of animals will terrify you. For you have shed man's blood, you have destroyed lands and cities and everyone in them. Of what value is an idol since a man has carved it or an image that teaches lies for he who makes it trust in his own creation. He makes idols that cannot speak. Woe to him who says to wood, come to life, or to lifeless stone, wake up. Can it give guidance? It is covered with gold and silver. There is no breath in it, but the Lord is in his holy temple. Let all the earth be silent before him. We'll read thus far. Friends, this morning we continue with our series in the book of Habakkuk. And I trust that uh, during the past two weeks, uh, you have began to understand uh, this prophecy a little bit better. Uh, it certainly has whet your appetite and you want to read it more and more. And certainly you want to dig through it more and more. Uh, the Lord has much to say to you and I from this short book of Habakkuk. And this morning, the title of my sermon is A Divine Revelation. A Divine Revelation. And we are looking at uh, the passage I read just now, Habakkuk chapter 2, from verse 2 to verse 20. Last week, we learned that in his frustration concerning God's plan for Judah, Habakkuk comes to understand the value of waiting on the Lord. Remember, God said to Habakkuk, because of the sin of Judah, I am raising up the Babylonians and they are going to come and they are going to be my agent. They are going to be a tool in my hand and they are going to exercise my judgment upon the people of Judah. And Habakkuk could not understand this. He could not understand how God could use the enemies of God's people to come and pass judgment on God's people, the people of Judah. Habakkuk couldn't understand how God could use a wicked and ungodly, a violent a nation to come and exercise judgment on people when he compared them to the Babylonians, he called uh, the people of Judah righteous people. And so he couldn't understand the plan of God. And so he was frustrated. And he questioned God more and more. And sometimes that's how things are in our lives when we can't understand the plan of God. We get frustrated and we question God more and more. So in his frustration, Habakkuk comes to understand the value of waiting on the Lord. 
And so he says to himself there in chapter 2, verse 1, I will stand at my watch and station myself on the ramparts. I will look to see. Very interesting words he uses here. Not I will hear or I will listen to hear what God has to say. I will look to see what he will say to me and what answer I am to give to this complaint. And so Habakkuk now is waiting upon the Lord. He has questioned God in his frustration. And now as he trusts in the Lord, now as he acknowledges that God is sovereign, that God is in charge, that God is king, that God has a perfect plan, he says to himself, now let me wait upon the Lord and let me uh, see what God has to say concerning the situation. Maybe, my brother, my sister, you are frustrated this morning in your walk with the Lord. Then why don't you and I be like Habakkuk and wait on the Lord? What is frustrating you this morning in your walk with the Lord? What are the challenges that you are facing this morning? What are the questions that you may be asking God this morning? Things that you can't understand. Won't you wait upon the Lord? The Lord wants to minister to you and I. The Lord has a message for you and I. The Lord has a revelation for you and I from his word. And as Habakkuk waits, notice that the Lord is faithful in responding. We don't know how long Habakkuk had to wait, but he waits in faithfulness because he knows that God, God hears him and God is faithful in responding to him. And likewise, my brother, my sister, you and I this morning need to do the same. As we wait upon the Lord, we wait in faithfulness, knowing that God hears us and knowing that God will respond to us. God will respond to you and I this morning. Continue to wait upon him. There is great value in waiting upon the Lord. Don't rush and make unwise, ungodly decisions for your life. Wait upon the Lord. Notice God's response to Habakkuk here in verse 2. The Lord said to him, write down the revelation. Write down the revelation and make it plain on tablets so that a herald may run with it. For the revelation awaits an appointed time. It speaks of the end and will not prove false. Though it linger, wait for it. It will certainly come and not delay. So as Habakkuk looks to see what God will say to him, God answers him through a revelation. See, God is faithful. He speaks to Habakkuk. He answers him through a revelation. And notice several things here concerning this revelation from God. Notice that God instructs Habakkuk to write it down. So this revelation seems to be something that Habakkuk could see. Maybe a vision or a dream, we're not exactly sure what it was, but he could see it. And only he could see it. But God says, I want you to write it down. Whatever you see, I want you to write it down. Why? Well, so that it could be read by others and not just Habakkuk only. You see, God has a message, not just for Habakkuk, but for others as well. And so that his message will not be forgotten. You see, we don't write things down, we can easily forget. Isn't that true? When you go uh, to shopping, for example, uh, you say to yourself, well, my mind is sharp, I'm still young, uh, I need to buy groceries for the month, I'm going with a big trolley, whatever it may be, and, and I can remember what I need. And halfway through the shopping, 
uh, you start forgetting things. And eventually when you come home, you realize that you left a few things behind because you did not write it down. We have to write it down so that we will not forget. And so God says to Habakkuk here, write it down so that you will not forget and so that others may also be able to read it. God also says that the revelation will come to pass at God's appointed time. Not at man's appointed time, not at the time that Habakkuk may be thinking about, but at God's appointed time. Therefore, it will not, or, therefore, though it lingers, he says, wait for it. It will certainly come and will not delay. God is saying to Habakkuk here about this revelation, it will happen at my appointed time. You need to wait for it. My brother, my sister, God has an appointed time. God has an appointed time for everything. Ecclesiastes reminds us of this. There is a time for, for everything. A time to be born and a time to die. God has a time for everything and his time is absolutely perfect. His time is always right. His time is always exact. It is precise. And God reminds Habakkuk here through this revelation, I have set the perfect time. I have appointed the time. Well, notice also that the revelation here speaks of an end. The end of the Babylonians, the enemies of God. But not just the end of the Babylonians, it also speaks of the end of God's enemies at the end of time. Who is God's enemy? Well, the enemy of God is Satan and all those who follow him, all those who oppose God, they are the enemies of God and God's people. And God is saying to Habakkuk here, in this context, speaking about the Babylonians, he says that a time I have set will come to pass and it is about destruction. But speaking about the future, he says that I have set a time when uh, this world and this world system will come to an end and I will destroy my enemies, those who oppose me. And then lastly, the revelation reminds us that there are two groups of people in this world. Have a look there at verse 4. See, he is puffed up. His desires are not right, but the righteous will live by faith. He's speaking of two groups of people here. On the one hand, there are the righteous who will live by faith or live by their faithfulness. You see, the righteous are men and women like Habakkuk. Men and women like the remnant. The remnant were a faithful few that still loved the Lord and followed the Lord in Judah amongst God's people. The righteous are men and women who walk the way of faith, trusting in God. The righteous are men and women who hold on to the promise of God. In Genesis chapter 15 verse 6, we read concerning Abraham. Abraham believed the Lord and he credited it to him as righteousness. You see, Abraham believed in the promise of God. And God said of him, he is a righteous man. The righteous will live by faith. But there's also another group of people here. A group who are arrogant. A group who are wicked. A group whose desires are not upright. They are ungodly. 
These are men and women who have rejected God and they live their lives to please their own sinful desires. This is the other group of people. Those who turn their backs on God. Those who shake their fists at God. Those who say to God, I can make it on my own. My works are good enough. My own righteousness, my own ability is good enough. I don't need you. These are men and women who, verse 6 reminds us, are driven by greed. Have a look there at verse 6. There are five woes here. A, a word of judgment that God speaks. Woe to him who piles up stolen goods and makes himself wealthy by extortion. Speaking of a greed. See, there are many in our world today and even uh, many sitting in the church, sadly, who live a life like this, who are driven by greed. They practice extortion. They enrich themselves. They want to become wealthy and they do so because they are driven by greed. They pile up stolen goods. They do things that do not please the Lord. These are men and women who practice, according to verse 9, injustice. Woe to him who builds his realm by unjust gain to set his nest on high. They don't care about justice. They don't care about doing what is right. They are only concerned about self-enrichment, making themselves wealthy. Doesn't it matter who is hurt in the process? It doesn't matter whose head they need to tramp on and step upon as long as they can enrich themselves. They are not trusting in God to provide for their needs. No, they do it by their own means because they are driven by greed, because they are driven by injustice. You see, the righteous trust upon God. God says to the righteous, do not worry about tomorrow. Do not worry about your clothes. I will provide for you. Seek my kingdom first. Seek my righteousness and all these things that you need, I will provide for you. So the righteous trust upon the Lord for that. But the unrighteous, the ungodly, the, the arrogant who, who looks to themselves, who depend upon themselves, who make themselves God, they are driven by greed. They are driven by injustice. Verse 12, they are driven by violence. Woe to him who builds a city with bloodshed and establishes a town by crime. Do you know people like this, my brother, my sister? Is this real in our world? Or is Habakkuk speaking about something uh, that's just maybe uh, a, a dream that he has, uh, something that is not true, that is not real, uh, maybe just a, a fairy tale? Of course not. This is a reality in our world. Our world is full of people who are driven by greed, injustice, and violence. Verse 15, the ungodly are driven by seduction. Woe to him who gives drink to his neighbor, pouring it from the wineskins till they are drunk. Well, come and join with me. Come and celebrate with me. Don't worry about the alcohol. I will provide. You know people like that? I will provide the drinks upon me. But they have ulterior motives. They will give you drink. They will pour it for you in your glass. So they will ha hand it to you in your hand. And when the, the glass is empty, they will refill it. When that second glass is empty, they will refill it. They will keep filling it. Not because uh, they, they want you to be happy. But because they have an ulterior motive. They have a, a seductive motive. Because when you are drunk, they unclothe you and they look upon you your nakedness. Can you see what kind of motives the wicked and the ungodly have? Verse 18, these are men and women who are driven by the practice of idolatry. 
God says to his people, I am the Lord your God. You shall worship no other God besides me. Worship me and me only. Do not make for yourself an idol that you will bow down to. But these men and women who do not know God, they practice idolatry. Listen there to verse 18. Of what value is an idol since a man has carved it? It's made by human hands. Or an image that teaches lies. For he who makes it trusts in his own creation. How foolish is that, God says. The man who made the idol trusts in the idol to provide for him. Yet he is the one who made the idol. He makes idols that cannot speak. Woe to him who says to wood, come to life. Or to the lifeless stone, wake up. Can it give guidance? It is covered with gold and silver, yet there is no breath in it. My brother, my sister, men and women who practice idolatry, who make a God for themselves and bow down to it and worship it. A God that cannot save them. A God that cannot provide for them. They provide for their gods. They provide the gold and the silver for their God. That statue. That God can't do anything for them. Yet they bow down and yet they worship it. You may say to yourself this morning, well, I don't do that. I have not made a God for me out of stone or wood. I don't bow down to anything. But my brother, my sister... The moment you and I put something in our hearts above the worship of God, then that thing becomes an idol and we begin to worship that thing. Whatever it may be, maybe money, maybe our family, maybe our career, maybe our church, whatever it may be, if you put something else before God, then that thing is an idol. It's just as good as bowing down to stone and to wood. And God says we must not do that. Otherwise his judgment will come upon us. And so God has a message. He has a revelation that he gives to Habakkuk. And God instructs him to write it down so that it may be read by others and not forgotten. God says to him the revelation will come to pass at my appointed time. And God says to him, it speaks of the end, the end of the Babylonians, but also the end of God's enemies. And the revelation reminds us of two groups of people. Those who live by faith, who the Bible speaks of as being righteous, who live a right life, desiring to glorify God, to put God first, to trust in the Lord like Abraham did. And those who shake their fists at God, the unrighteous, the ungodly, those who practice unbelief, who are driven by greed, injustice, the love for violence, who enjoy seduction, who practice idolatry. And God's, uh, God says to them there in verse 16, you will be filled with shame instead of glory. Now it is your turn Drink and be exposed. The cup from the Lord's right hand is coming around to you and disgrace will cover your glory. The cup from the Lord's right hand speaks of judgment. God's judgment will come upon the ungodly. And so my brother and sister, as we close this morning, which of these two groups speaks of you? Which of these two groups speaks of you and I? Are you the righteous one who lives by faith, trusting in the Lord? Or are you the unrighteous one, the self-sufficient one, who says to God, thank you very much. I can do it on my own. I don't need you. I am a self-made man, a self-made woman. I can make it on my own. 
The things of this world matter more to you than the things of God. My brother, my sister, as you and I examine our hearts, which one are you? I trust that each one of us here this morning can say, I am the one who the Bible calls the righteous. And my desire is to live by faith, trusting in the Lord and no one else. But if God has spoken to your heart and you realize that you are actually the other one, the ungodly one, then you can do something about that today because God wants to change your heart. And you can come before the Lord and you can say, Lord, forgive me. Forgive me for putting other things first in my life instead of you. I want, I want to stop that. I want to put you first. Forgive me for being violent. Forgive me for being greedy. Forgive me for practice injustice. Help me. Change me. Make me a righteous person. My brother, my sister, if you are sincere and come before the Lord, he can do that for you. Come, let's pray. Our Father, we come before you in Jesus' name. We thank you, Lord, for the great reminder from your word. The revelation that you spoke to Habakkuk. But Father, you've also spoken another revelation and you've spoken it through your son. And it is recorded for us in the pages of scripture. You have revealed yourself to us in the person of Jesus. And Lord, through the Lord Jesus, you have shown us how you desire us to live. May we be that men and women, faithful, holy, righteous, trusting in you. Father, if we have failed to do that, forgive us. Change our hearts, we pray. Bring us in line with the life that you desire for us. And now we pray that the grace of God the Father Almighty the love of the Lord Jesus Christ, the sweet fellowship of God the Holy Spirit, rest and abide on each one of us now and forevermore. And all of God's people said, Amen. Amen. Friends, the Lord bless. We trust that you'll have a wonderful day.